Hello, welcome back to Go on the Run. And today we're going to look at building Docker images part two. Now, in part one, we saw two ways of building a Docker image. The first was simply to start up a container and then modify it. And then after we had all the changes we wanted in that container, we didn't want to lose it. So what we did was we commit that container as an image, committed all the changes as an image. And then now we were able to use that image to create other containers with our changes. Then the second thing we did was to put some instructions in the file to do essentially the same thing and run the same command that we, we ran in the container, we use the docker build command to then create an image. And I said that you want to go the route of the docker file because it's more reproducible. It's um, something that you can commit, other people can contribute to and so on. In this part, we're going to continue building Docker images using the Docker file. And specifically, we're going to build a Docker image with a application that we, let's say we're going to pretend that we wrote an application and we want it to be an image. And so when containers are created with this image, the application is already in place and ready to run. But before we do that, I want to show you a little illustration of something I mentioned in passing. And that is, I said that when we create Docker, when we have Docker images, they use something called an overlay file system. And the overlay file system comes in because uh, when we were building images, it created another layer, right? And then we were able to make changes to that layer, which created yet another layer. And we saw this with the run command. I showed you that there were all these steps. And each time the run command each run command made some changes to the image and that was committed and it formed a layer. Now, I figured this illustration might help you if you're having some trouble figuring out what the, the layers of the file system um, are. And so let's imagine that we had this um, base image and it had a file, file A or directory, doesn't really matter, but it had some files. And as we know, each image has a unique value associated with it. And let's say we are using a Docker command, um, Docker file, and we say run the touch command and touch B. What we know will happen is that a new layer will be created, right? And why? Because a container will be created to run this command and then it will be committed as another image. But a new layer will be created in terms of the file system I'm talking about now, and it will have our file B that we just created from our touch command. And because this is a new image essentially with another layer, what we will have is a different um, checksum value, right? Or image ID. And then if we add another command, and let's say that's called touch C, again, another layer will be created. And now we'll have that um, file C. Now notice at each layer, we're still being able to access the file from the previous layer. And of course this new layer will have you know, its own ID. And we can see at this upper layer, we can have access to all the files. And it's almost like if we're projecting down through the layers to access the files. Okay, so that is how a layer file system work. It's just the ability to have a set of changes on your file system in such a way that you can represent them as a union. You might also see people talk about overlay file system or union file system. And in part three, I'll do a little example using um, Unison file system and show you exactly how we could create like Unison some directories together to give a unified view. Okay, so just to recap, um, I'm going to go through this a little bit fast, but I want to jog your memory. Remember your memory. Remember I said that uh, with a Docker image, you can create containers, which we have seen. And the image sort of, it, it provides a number of things, right? It, it tells you the files, which we've seen already. You create files and put them in the image. We play with that a lot. And it uses the idea of overlay file system, which is what I mentioned before, but didn't show you a picture of. Uh, I just showed you that illustration. And then it specifies which ports you can access from that um, container and we'll get to see that today and then some multiple paths and there are some other things but we're not going to worry with that so so as not to make this video forever long let's jump to some um, the command line and start playing with this so now I'm at my command line I'm going to change to a directory um, for part two and in this directory let me start by Visual Studio Code 
and I'll show you exactly what I have in this directory. There we go, and increase the font size a bit. And so I have two files. I have this file called Docker file, and this is no different than the one that we, we had previously. And so from which is base, we know that oh, we need to start somewhere with a base image. We run a command called hello. Uh, we have another command here. This is not going to make any changes to our image. Um, then the next command here is to update our image and install some application. Previously, I installed tree command. Here I am installing Vim and HTOP for no particular reason other than to add more things to it. We have a working directory, and I explained that in a previous video why we want to change our working directory before we do things like this one. Um, they run this command where we're making a directory, some directories. If we didn't change our working directory, it would create it in slash slash and we don't want that so we want slash root and so if you haven't watched a previous video look at that the only thing that's new is this add command and so i'm running this add command and i say add something which is the source name which is a file or it could be a directory too and i'm saying add it this dot means to the current directory but our current directory is the working directory which is root now i do not have a file in this directory called add and as you can see this is going to be if i run this now it's going to fail because it's going to look for a file called app in this directory and it is not there so my intention is to run this go program compile it and call it app and this is what this go program is it's a very simple program so let me resize this a little bit it's a very simple program open this up a little bit too and so all it does is it take the current time when it runs and it gets the host name and then it prints a message on the console that says, you know, hello world from the host with the, at the time. Okay, so this is very straightforward. So let's go to command line and I'm going to do go build. And if I just run, I'll get an application and it gets that rather ugly name. I don't want that. So I'll remove that. And because I wanted this to run in Linux, I cannot just do go build. What I have to do is say go OS is equals to Linux and then go build and then minus out I'm gonna call it app and so now if I do ls minus l for example we can see that now I have this program called app and um, it is a Linux binary because if I do file app it should tell me that oh, it's ELF executable which is for Linux if it was from my Mac it would say Darwin okay so that's all good so let's go ahead now and build our image so i'll say docker build if you remember if i do dot it means in this directory i have to give the path so build in this directory and you know execute this command in this docker file the build command expect those files and then i could do minus t for tag and let's just call this um stryversity v versity v r s i t y stryversity forward slash um app let's call it app and then part two dot one so, so so that way right so we're on part two and this is the first one so let's treat it that way and so i'm gonna run this notice how it says from ubuntu this is the image id then it says i'm gonna run this command in this container created with this id this is the output of running it then it says removing intermediate container ecc whatever and then it produced an image with that name. Then it's going to create another container, even though that image is really not very different from this guy because our command didn't really do anything, didn't really make any changes. It created another container in which is running these commands, and that's the output from those commands. And at the end of this, it's going to say removing it, and then of course create a new Cut image, all these are gonna be intermediate. We don't have to really worry about it, but let's scroll down. I showed you this before. And so as you can see, removing intermediate container, and there's the image that was created from that. I mean, before it removed it, it actually committed, but we don't see that. And so now it used this image to create yet another container in which it run this command, which doesn't really do anything. It removes it, creates, <laughs> there's the image, and it repeats this. I've shown you just before. And so successfully at the end, we the last thing was to add app to application to that container. So you could think of the add command like a copy command. Now, um, if you want documentation besides you know 
your plugin here telling you what these commands do. So you can see add hello world to this path or to a relative path to the working directory or something. You can look at the online documentation. So I can click on that and then say open. And as you can see, it takes me straight to the documentation page in um, on Docker. So let me do this. Let me increase my screen a little bit so people don't complain. It's too small. I understand if it if you complain, don't worry, it's okay. So let me know. And so you can scroll down to the left side here and you can look at the add command. And so that's the documentation for the add command. The add command and the copy command uh, works essentially the same way. Um, I generally don't like things that provide a programming type environment that provide multiple commands to do the same thing. But Docker, I don't know if it's because it over evolved over time that they added extra command, but yes, the, the add and copy command are essentially um, the same. They can do essentially the same thing. Um, okay, so you can always look at the documentation. Let's go back here. And so here is our tag for our image. Of course, we can just use the image ID also. And so let's do this. Let's do docker run minus IT for interactive minus minus RM to remove this after I'm finished with it. And then this is my image ID. And if I run it, you can see um, I didn't have to tell it which command to run because this is based on the docker image which has its entry point set as bash. That's going to make sense. We're going to talk about entry here in a bit, but which has its entry point set as bash. So it's running the bash shell by default. And notice because our working directory was set in our overwrite of this image to be the um, root directory. Now we're in this directory and we, had not, we have not only the directories we created, but this app program. And so I can do this and if I run it, you can see it's run from within this container. It's telling me, oh, this is the container ID as the host name and the current time. And if I run this again, we'll see, we should see that the time is going to change, but the container ID is different. If I do exit, notice how the container we're running ended with 4FF0. I'll rerun it again. I get a totally different container. And now if I do history, I don't have any commands I was running before, but I still have those files. And so now app, app. I run it and you can see I get a different host name because it's a different container. So that now we've created an image with our application in it. Okay, so what if we wanted um, our application to, let's say, not just print out something and exit, but maybe a web application where it starts up and it um, listen for a request and it responds to that request. So let's write a simple web application very, very quickly. So I'm going to close this so you can see exactly what I'm doing, but I'm going to speed it up just a little bit. Remember, you can pause the video or slow it down, you know, to half the speed or whatever to see exactly, but you really should, shouldn't worry about me typing it up. What you really should be interested in is at the end, do you understand what I've typed up? And I'm going to explain it so you shouldn't have to worry. So here we go. All right. So that's it. So what I have is a very simple, well, almost it. I have a very simple application. When you start it, means it prints out a log message saying start an HTTP server. I have something that says um, for the HTTP service or package, I want to set the handler function for the slash root or the slash path. And usually that's index and I call it, say that, oh, this path, every time you access this path, this function would be called, this callback essentially to deal with it. Of course, when this function is called, HTTP pass to it a writer and the request information. So now we can use the writer and we can say, I want to send something back to the client who made this request. So we'll send back to the client hello world from that at that, right? And instead of saying hello world, we can say hello and the name of that client, um, you know, hello, whoever, the name of the client. My name is, and the host name and the time, all right? And so what is the host name? The client that's connected is our, that remote address. There we go. 
And so as you can see, what I'm passing are just these three parameters, the remote address for the connection, the request, the host name, my host name, and the time, uh, nothing very fancy. And so once I, my function is called, that would be written back to the client who is making this request. And then I just listen and serve. And so we should be here listening. Now listen and serve returns in error. So we can do like ERR colon equals. And then we can say something like if there's an error, right? Like this, then we want to do log ROS fatal error to log that error. If not, then no problem. We should be just stuck here listening and serving. So, all right. So let me exit once again. And I'm going to build our application. So I'll do go GOS and rebuild our application. So hopefully no error, no error there. And this time when I do Docker build, I'll call this application version two. So it's part two application version two. And so we run it and notice how this was much faster because we didn't have to do any of these commands that took a long time. The only thing we had to rerun was this guy, which was to copy the app. And you can see this because it says using cache, using cache for all the other things. And I've shown you this before. So now we're up and we're ready to run. So let's rerun our application. And this time I'll use the last image ID here. And let's run this. And so now here we are. And I can run my application and say app and now it's listening okay but how do i access it so let me open open a second terminal so there we go and now if i do docker ps i do a grep for um my container here with this id 3ff 3f33 i get this and you can see that that's running it has some name or the other, but it is running. Um, but I don't see anything else. Now, what do I mean by I don't see anything else? So maybe let me do this. And I do PS this way. But if you look, I have some other containers running and it look like if there's some ports, you can see here ports that are exposed by those containers. And we haven't talked about ports yet, but here's my container that we have running right now. Let me open this up. We have our container running here and there it is, but my port that I'm listening on, port AT80, is not being shown. Now, can I access that port? So how do I get to that port in this container? Well, I have the container name, but there's no way for me to access that port to get to that container, the port that's actually running inside the container. So what we need to do is export the port. And so the way we do that is we map a port from the machine that we're on, my Mac, to a port that's running on that container. And the way we pull this off is by going back to our Docker file. And then we say, oh, one of the things I want to do is export a port. And as you can see, here's the export command. And the port we want to export, you can do a range of port or you can do individual ports or just one port. So we'll just do 8080 because that's the port I want to export from within my container. Because why? This application opens that port internally in the container. So I want that to be reflected outside the container. So now let's go back and let's exit. And once again, we'll do Docker build. And this time we call it version three for our application, even though we haven't changed the source code at all. The only thing we've changed is our build file. And so now, We've exported this port and notice that resulted in a container, intermediate container, but it doesn't matter. All we care about is the final image ID. And so if I, you know what, let me use this instead to run our, um, so we'll just see Docker run and I'll use this instead. And so version three, and I run that. No, Nothing would have changed visually here, but let's just do a watch here and see what happens. So if I do watch minus D and then I watch my PS command and let's do that. Well, actually I only care about the top two. So I'm gonna do head minus two. So let's do that. Ah, come on. And so there. I'm going to watch the top two. 
And so, um, if you look now, you'll see that here is my last container running bash and on the port is as port 80, but I still cannot access it. It's just saying that I'll basically Docker PS command know how this container exported, exposes port 80. Why? Because the image says, so remember we build the image and we have this command that says export port 80, but I have nothing running yet. How do I know that all this um, wouldn't work is because let me open up yet in third terminal and let's do curl localhost colon 8080 and nothing connection refused there's nothing running on my computer local computer even though the container is saying and there's no way for me to access the container so what we need to do is map it okay so the way I can do that now is if I even if I start this up and I say app and now it's running still when I do this it's with connection refused because this is running I can guarantee you that this is running within the container how do I know that it's because I'll open up yet another terminal and what I'll do is I'll say docker run minus it no but docker exec minus it and I'm going to enter that same container this very container here this guy I'm going to enter that container and if I do this and I run the bash command actually and I do bash now I'm inside this container and as you can see I have the same host name in both and so it's running so if I do curl yeah that's why I should I might need to add the curl command but if I do curl localhost port 8080 oh curl command that fun so let's do app install minus y curl oh, we should probably add that to our docker file so we have it in all of our images and so now if i go back and i run this oh local host local host i need to spell that properly and so as you can see when i run this command let me clear up my screen and run it again as you can see it says hello and because i'm connecting locally that's my ip and it says my name is and you can see the host name again and the time so we know how this web service is running because i'm connecting it through curl but this is from within the container i still haven't shown you how i can access it externally because there's no way to access it externally so what i have to do is i have to stop this container and run it a very special way in order for me to access it ex externally and so i'm going to exit from that container and what I'm going to do is let me move this down here. And so let's clean up a bit and clean up a bit here. And so the way I'm going to rerun this command is by saying minus P and I can put a local port that I want to use map to the port inside the container what i mean by that i can say one well, locally i want it to be mapped from port 8080 on my computer to the port 8080 within the container of course i could use a different port number on my computer that's available i could say port 8000 for example if i want it right um so and then i want it to be mapped to port 8080 within the container and you could use several of these minus p command let's say you had several application or an application that, op that opens several ports you can do that too because we saw the export command allow you to specify multiple ports and now when i run this this way notice i'm back in that container but notice the difference here it has my local computer host name and that port the reason why you see 000 is saying that oh, i've mapped every interface that's available on my map on my mac to port 8080 and it's pointing notice it's point to port 80 within the container so now if i were to run the curl command again of course it says it's mapped it but remember we haven't started our application in the container yet so i should expect this to have connection refuse and similarly if i go into that container and so let's go back and rerun this. So if I go back into that container, within the container, if I do curl, of course, curl is not going to work. So I have to do apt install minus y curl, but it's pretty fast. So um, that should be finished in just a jiffy. So let's clean up. And if I do curl localhost 8080, nothing is running so i'm in the container i can't access anything i'm outside the container can't access anything because nothing is running 
But the nice thing is I already have this mapping set up. So now when I start my application inside the container like this, and now inside the container I try to access it, this work. And now from outside, if I do that, well, I've been using the wrong IP address here. So I need to change this to port 8000. So there we go. And so now you can see I can access it, right? Now, to show you how this actually works, if I stop my application, you can see that this is going to say connection refused, right? I mean, there's nothing, there's, there's no server running. But, and I could see that from internally and egg both externally, that there's nothing running, okay? But once I have my server up and running, I can access it from my Mac and I can access it, of course, from within the container. Notice from within the container, I have to use port 8080 because that's what's running as internally. Outside on my Mac, I use 8000 because that's what I map it to, All right? So that is a nice and easy way in which you can map the port from that you want to expose inside your container, right? And then, of course, the person who's creating the container, they have the option of whether they want to map it or not, right? And you saw that from my example. If I do Control D, exit this guy, and I do Docker, PS, you can see that oh, I'm running some application here that has a port 9410 that I'm not mapping because I don't care to map that particular port, right? But then there's some other port like 9411 that I am mapping. So it's up to the user. You can export as many ports as you like if you're going to have something running there. It's up to the user to map whichever one they want and they can choose how they want to map it. Like some of them I use the same number sometimes because it depends on which ports you have available on your computer. All right, so your local host. All right, so now what we've seen that, the last thing I want to show you is how we can use entry point. And so for that, let me control C here, exit. And we know that all we want curl. So let's add that to our select command that we want. And notice, you see, that's why it's good to have a file because we can just easily come add to our file and then, you know, just rebuild. So one of the other things we can do is we after we add our application is we can say entry and then the entry point is this executable. And as you can see, if you need to pass options to that application, um, let's say we've written our application so it can take, let's say, minus minus port and then an argument, we can totally do that, right? So we can say this is, you know, our app. And then if we want to pass some options like minus P for port, for example, and we want it to run on port 80,000 or some other port, right? Let's just say we change our application such that, um, let me close this so we can see it. Let's say instead of art coding the port number here, instead what we did was we had a variable. So we had var and we had port and it's something that you can change and maybe the default port is 8080 and then we used we want to use the flags package and we want to do string var and ampersand port and then we want it to be called p and we want a default value of port and this is going to be this is the port number all right something is very creative like that and let's save it and that imported the port the flags package for us and so now here, what we can do is then here, I'm going to do just do this plus port, and that should give us the same effect. And so let's save this. And then I need to say flag that parse. Without saying parse, it doesn't parse the flags. And so, well, we can just go back to our Docker file because we do have this minus P option, and we could say, oh, I actually want you to use port 8000. And of course, if we tell it to start on 8000, well, because we're exposing port 80, it's not going to work. So we'll need to change this. So let's build with this again. So let's say go OS, rebuild my application. Let's do Docker build. Oh man, and five. This is the last one. It's finished. And then I'll do Docker run. And then this time I'll do five, let it map to whichever port it wants to map to. So there we have 
it map into 5503 and put 8000 so let's see if this work kind of clean this up so there we go so we can tell that oh, this is coming from my container and i am on my mac right if i do u name minus a you can see it says darwin kernel so i am on a mac whereas this stuff is running inside linux so that's it um i think <laughs> that's sort of enough recap we built an image with our own custom application. That application is a web application that opens a port. We're able to export that port from our con from our um, container when it's running. We're able to map it on our local machine when it's running Docker. So that's going to be whether you're running Docker in Mac or on Windows or in Linux. And then we're able to connect to that application over you know the port that was open. All right, uh, I think that's good enough. Um, if you've reached this part of the video and you haven't subscribed yet, please consider subscribing. Um, hope you like the material. Um, for those of you who support me through Patreon page, thank you very much. This is going to be the last video for this year. Thanks for all your support. Thanks for subscribing. Thanks for your patience. And I look forward to seeing you next year. I have a lot of exciting new things that I'm going to be doing. Hi, this is Vero in 2021. And since I didn't get this video out on time before the end of the year, even though I recorded it before the end of the year, but I didn't get it out. Um, so let me give you a little bit of a treat slash teaser. One thing that's going to be coming up in the year 2021 that I'd like to cover, show you, and that is WebRTC. And we can do it right here in our browser. So this works very well in Chrome and Firefox. It should also work in Opera, but then if you go to um, anything like Safari or something, your mileage may vary. So now I have a Firefox window open and it's empty. And what I want to do is get to the JavaScript console. And I could do it by clicking in this Firefox menu to the side here and then going down to web developer and then go to, you know, web console. And that puts me here. And so I've already zoomed in a little bit to make it nice and big. Now, if you're not using Firefox, but instead using Chrome, you can essentially do the same thing in Chrome. Now I said, what I'm gonna show you is going to work very well in Chrome or Firefox. It might even work in Microsoft Edge browser or Safari, but your mileage may vary with those. So what you wanna do is do the same thing, kind of go here and then to go to more tools and then developer tool. And that's going to open the JavaScript console. As you can see here, it says console. And of course, if you want, you can zoom in to, you know, sort of get a bigger screen. Now I'm going to do what I want to show you, this little teaser. I'm going to do it in Firefox. But remember I said it can work in either Chrome or Firefox. So the first thing we want to do is on our blank screen here, we don't have our blank page writer. We don't have anything in the document. If you don't know about HTML, we don't have anything in our document to display our body to display. So let's put some HTML within our body so it can display it. And so what I'm going to add is a video element and a text. So the way we can do this is we can say document dot body. So we access the body element for this document. And you can see that you can um, access this on attributes. I'm going to say inner HTML right and it shows you an example there of how you can set the inner html for this um, body and for us what we want to do like i say is create a div tag and so that's the div tag right there and what i want to do is within this div tag i want to create a video tag and another div tag with some text so the video tag via deo video and then the id for that video tag i'm going to call it local video for example local video, maybe I call it something like that. And then I want to have an add, add an attribute to this video tag called auto play. And then I'm going to close my video tag. Like I said, I want to have another div element and I'm going to put hello me, for example, inside of that div element. And then I close the whole thing. And so if I just close this off, you can see that the screen went with whatever text was there before. And now I have my hello me. My video tag is supposedly up here, but I can't see anything because I'm not sending any video to it. 
but we want to change this background so we can see it. So let's create a background. Let's change it to white. So I'm going to say let s, so just a variable, equals to document.body.style. So I'm going to stay, save the style of this background, of this body, to a variable s. And I'm going to say s that background color. So I'm going to change the background color of this the body, I'm going to say that's equal to W-H-I-T-E, white. And so there we go. I said white and you can see it. So we've actually just created a HTML dynamically instead of putting it in a file and loading it up with a server or something. But I think it's fun. So it's a nice little teaser for what I want to show you. And so if I didn't mention it, what um, this teaser is about is about using WebRTC so you can do video conferencing. In the age of this pandemic, video conferencing has become very, very popular. And WebRTC has played an important role in that in many of the applications that you might not be aware that you're using, especially in your browser and so on. And so WebRTC is something I got introduced to several years ago at a company I was working at at the time that was doing video conferencing. And I thought it would be cool to kind of resurrect some of that now and do some video about it. So this is a teaser of what's going to come later in this year. I don't know exactly when, but I will be sure to make some video about it. I'm going to use WebRTC. I'm going to show you that. And of course, we're going to do it with Go also. So here, there you go. Uh, but here, let's have some, a little bit of fun. So I'm not going to do exactly WebRTC because part of WebRTC, like I said, is showing video and audio and sharing it um, with others, right, in a video conference. So the first part is to be able to get your own video and audio so you can even see yourself before you can even worry about sending it somewhere. So let's do that. So we're going to get our own video and audio. And before we do that, we have to have permission to use it. So we have to set some constraint that we want um, basically saying, what is it that we're going to request from our browser to be able to access? So let's do let constraint equal this JavaScript object. And I would say video colon true saying that, yes, we want access to the video camera or whichever camera is available. And we want access to audio. So this would be like a microphone, for example. And so this would create this constraint object. And the way you get access to these things through the router is you have to have access to the navigator. And navigator basically means the browser. So I have to say navigator dot media devices and then get user media. And then I give it the constraint, this constraint. Now, this is going to return a promise. Now, if you don't know anything with JavaScript programming and promises, don't worry, just literally type everything that I'm typing. And let me zoom in just a little bit more, make it this even bigger. Okay, that's the biggest it would go. And so I'll do that. Then, so when this first call returns a promise, I'm saying when that promise is fulfilled, then run this function. Um, now I'm not gonna I'm gonna ignore like if the promise fail or anything like that because we don't expect any of that. I say here's the function I'm gonna pass you, and there's the function, and this function takes what is called a stream as a parameter. So here, what happens is the promise when it's fulfilled returns a stream. Now you can think of this as this guy returns a stream, but it wraps it up in a promise. So that's the stream that you get here. When we get a stream, because we're inside of a function that's here in this, um, you know, the then um, callback, what we can do is set it on the window. So you can say window, which represent the global, you know, namespace for the browser. And so we can say window that stream is equal to stream. Right. So essentially, I just created a local variable. So create a local variable, a global variable rather, global variable that we can access once we're outside um, this function. All right. So now that we have that, you can see when I press enter, what I've been asked me, which camera would I like to uh, show or access? And I could, if I wanted to, point it to that camera and then which microphone or which um, it's an external microphone device or some other microphone, you know. And so I guess I remember my decision and I can say hello. And if you have a camera right now, you should see your camera being activated by, you know, turning on. And so that's exactly what happened to my camera. So now that we have a camera and you can see promise pending. So what we want is to assign that variable to our video. 
So let's get that video element. And so one way we can get it is to say let video or me or whatever, let's call it me. Well, video, that's good enough. Is equals this variable variable is equals to document that get element by ID. Now, which element do we want to get by ID? We want to get this video that is called this element here called video by the ID local video. So let's get that. And if we do this and run this, we'll see that oh now we have this video, and you can see when I access that variable video, you can see it is highlighting this above there, and you can see it has that ID and autoplay. Now it should have been autoplay equals true. I don't know why it has autoplay with an empty string, but anyway, that's fine. And so we can do this that source src object is equals to the stream. But if you remember, the stream, when we got it back in this callback, we assign it to window. And so that's why we're able to access it. What we could have done is within this callback to do exactly what we're doing, which was assign it to the video object, the video element, if we had an element, or even get these two commands, put these two commands, the you know, get element by ID in the video thing. We could have all put that in the one callback. So number of ways of skinning this cat. But now we enter this, now you can see that how oh, my video is pointing to um, my pens and all this other good stuff. And I could show you that oh, this is a live feed by putting my hands in front of it and I can move some stuff around. And some of you who follow my video know that oh, um, this channel, when I was doing embedded programming, would recognize this guy as my older for embedded objects, you know, like my Arduino and so on like that. So there is a video source, um, you know, if you stream your video to yourself on a web page. It, all, it took us all of what five commands maybe so that is a little teaser of what's going to be happening so we can take the stream now create a webrtc pair and then connect to someone else and send them our video stream so that's it um let me get back to the regular programming now so stay tuned take care bye